Okay, sorry. The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. A show for all who are on the journey to discover the truths about their identity, history, culture, politics, spirituality, and family relationships. This is a show for the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Generation and the hip hop generation, including Black Lives Matter and associate activists, all of whom are seeking change. Dr. Oba Tashaka and his guests are dropping knowledge and insight from his successful organizing, research, writings, and innovative thoughts, the best of which have piped into God's mind to lift you up higher and higher. To the bosses, OGs, rappers, influencers, and those looking to evolve from the constraints of misinformation and miseducation to build a foundation for personal growth, love, and mental freedom. Check out the wisdom of the OR. Yeah, that's the original revolutionary, Oba T who inspired a million black men with his rousing speech at the Million Man March and who continues to fight, write, and speak the truth. Dr. Oba Tashaka is one of the deepest deep thinkers in the world today. A quote by Dr. Asa Hilliard. Dr. Oba Tashaka, then Bill Bradley, was the best leader organizer in the Congress of Racial Equality an endorsement from Dr. George Wiley, Associate Director of National Corps and the best organizer blacks produced in the 1970s as the organizer of the National Welfare Rights Organization. The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. Greetings. To all the viewers, um, we have a special treat here today. You have had the privilege, some of you that have been watching the show all along, of uh, seeing and interacting with Professor Menu Ampen. Um, we've had him on a couple of times, and he's, he's an expert on a number of areas, one of which is the revolutionary Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, he exposed the fraud of um, the um, fake history. Uh, what was the name of that, Manu? That guy, Willie Lynch. He exposed the lie of Willie Lynch. He wrote a little book on it and proved it was wrong. And then I found out some of us had an investment in Willie Lynch. We wanted Willie Lynch even if he didn't exist. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, this is a brother that I really love. Glad to have you on. Brother Menu, and uh, let's get you get you on. Thank you, Brother Shaka. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be back with you. Right on. Uh, this is a brother who puts his whole self into his work. That's why um, he's one of my favorites of the scholars. I tell people, this brother is real good. You should have him on your show. You should be pushing him. He's bad, as in good. You know what I mean? So today, uh, the topic for today is going to be the origins of ancient Kush discovered through primary research. This is the work of uh, Professor Menu Ampen, uh, who um, I'll introduce in a minute. But uh, he's a primary researcher, and uh, he's, he's written a very important work on uh, ancient African history, which we'll mention in a minute. Uh, so this is going to be the show, and uh, Professor Menu Ampian is going to have some slides to show you in the beginning and then some commentary on his work. Uh, but what I want to do, first of all, is acknowledge our viewers, Lao Tzu, uh, Wolf Manlu, Brother Ogawa, M. Jewel, 
Emerald Rock. Um, let's see who else we have here. BB Gina, uh, Gloria Briscoe, which she checked in, I think, early. Um, uh, Sister Robin, uh, Worry Smith. And let's see if we have anybody else here. Lynn Morrow. Okay. Greetings to all of you and others who uh, join. Um, so again, the topic for today is the origin of ancient Kush discovered through primary research. But before getting into that, I wanted to uh, uh, make some comments on the recent murder of Tyree Nichols um, in Memphis by, um, I think it was five black police officers. Normally we're used to getting this as a story of white cops killing blacks. And I'll make comments on that, but um, they released the um, photos, particularly the, uh, the pictures of his um, murder. And uh, it was on last night, so a lot of you may have seen it. Very upsetting. Um, and most of the um, footage coming from the cameras of the police reveal very little because it was cameras that they had at their hips. You could see the camera where the policeman just pulled him out of the car and had him on the ground. And you could see a little bit of the beating, but basically uh, you saw the, uh, the stun gun that probably along with the beating killed him. You could just hear it. And then the rest was blank. And then a whole lot of picture of the cops wipe, wiping water off their eyes like that was all they were concerned about. But then the real revelation was in the telephone pole camera, which is a police camera. They were stupid enough to stop him where it could be recorded. And that one told the story. And what you saw, the things I want to stress here, is African-American culture on display. And some of the CNN commentators, particularly Van Jones, who has some experience with police work, treated this like it was exceptional. This is an average black family. And what you saw in his death and then the reaction of his family, and of course what you're seeing now nationwide in terms of the reaction to this murder, is a statement of the culture. And so the first thing that you saw in this you know, video was him being pulled out of the car. Now, with the police camera, the emphasis was on the beat down. But when he's pulled out of the car, he's told to lay down. He says, yes. He says, I'm complying. You know what I mean? And he's doing everything else that he was told to do. And if you look at his history, Tyree Nichols, T-Y-R-E Nichols, uh, Tyree was a free spirit. He was six foot three and weighed 140 pounds. And the reason he didn't have more weight is he, stuff, he suffered from Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease prevents you from really putting body fat on and you really can't eat that much. And he was a skateboarder. At six foot three, you usually can't be a skateboarder. But because he had all of that movement in him, but he was skin and bones. And so in these big old hurly criminal behaving, self-hating black cops, one pulled him out, they could have picked him up with one hand. And so he was complying and he was going through, yeah, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. What he was showing in his response, what is basic to African-American culture, that when we run around talking about, oh, they took our humanity from us. We need reparations because we lost our humanity in slavery. We didn't lose our humanity. We faced inhumane conditions. It did not make us inhumane. We came out of slavery with our humanity intact with scars. You hear me? But the humanity was a key thing. And it was the humanism of this brother here that runs throughout this whole narrative. And the humanism of his family, um, uh, Rovan um, Nichols, the mother, uh, or Rovan Wells, 
the mother, uh, who expressed the same sentiments that all black mothers almost are going to express. And when she said, my son was a nice son, she said, I know a lot of people say their sons are nice, but they ain't all nice. My son was nice. This is a brother who had come from watching a sunset. This is a brother who skateboarded because he had an expression of freedom. This is a brother that identified with Black Lives Matter. This was a brother who was anti-police violence, but dig this, was thinking about becoming a cop to uh, be the system to change it. He was just thinking about it. And then he was talking about in these anti-police demonstrations, he was seeing cops who were getting on their knees without any weapons. And so he was looking for the silver lining. You know what I mean? This was a free spirit. This was a whole lot of black males and females in this country. You hear me? And so when he's beat and he's com complying, he's realizing this ain't working. He gets up and runs. And what's he running for? His mama. His mama is only about three minutes away. He was close to his house. There was no reason for this stop other than that he was black because a unit has been formed inside of the Memphis police called the Scorpion Unit, and it was founded by the chief of police, Serilyn Davis, who was the one that expressed all the outrage over it. But she's the one that formed this unit, which is a killer unit. And if you're going to give it this name, Scorpion, Scorpion sting and kill. And these are supposed to be some cops who are going to stop crime. Well, this is a criminal unit, and you could see it. And so in the beatdown, what you saw was the nightsticks hitting him on his head and his body. Constant beatings. And these guys are big. If you look at them, muscle-bound big brothers. And then you saw the fifth brother, if you want to call him that. This I, I could use another word for him. He comes in, runs in, and starts kicking him, kicking him on one side, and then gets on the other side and kicks him again. They're treating him like he's not a human being. This is the behavior you expect to come. You, you don't really want it to come, but from whites who have been dehumanized by slavery, by, by their culture, that, that see us as subhuman. But to see blacks do this, well, on the one hand, you can say, yeah, they're cops. They're trained in this. But on the other hand, this displayed a level of dehumanization that is serious self-hatred. And what I described since the late 60s, a choice between two cultures. And so what you're seeing there is uh, behavior going beyond the extreme. Those kicks and everything, hatred to an extreme. And then you're seeing him lay there for some time while medical units are around and doing nothing. You know what I mean? So this is a statement of the reality that Black folks are facing in this country. And uh, the police are like the guardians of the system. As the wealth gets concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, 1% has got close to 90% of the wealth. Their answer is not jobs. Their answer is not housing. You've got rising homelessness. Their answer is not improving education. Their answer is not a just society. It's beefy, beef up on the police. And when Black Lives Matter and other activists demanded cutting police budgets to put them in social programs, you have your president of the United States talking about no. But at the same time, he's voicing sympathy to the family. So what you're seeing is savagery on display. And in this particular case, this behavior, in my generation, when this behavior occurred, that would be the one-tenth of 1% 1 of Blacks who on the plantation were the slave breakers. That was They were used to break Blacks. That was a severe minority of them. And when Blacks got a chance, they took them out and killed them. 
but now it's a growing number. It's still minority, but it's a choice between two cultures. These people have bought into white itis to a degree that's devastating. And if you have a nation state where they're running it, and I see Sister Susan Tata is there, greeting sister. You know how this works in Africa. When they do a beat down there, it's straight up torture because they're doing it the same way the CIA does it, but with the glee that they have, but they're black. You know what I mean? That's elitism in Africa. And it's a special group that's been trained that way. And then with all of these kids who have been brought into uh, these child murder squads and uh, various parts of Africa where this has happened, particularly the Congo and some other areas, these are children who are put in a position to uh, kill uh, simply because they're being forced to. That's not their choice between two cultures, but the kind of people who are doing it, it is. So there's a message that I wanna leave you with on this one. One, we need to support all the brothers and sisters who've been engaged in struggles against this. This is key. Black Lives Matter and affiliates, because there's a whole lot of groups that are not Black Lives Matter who are doing this. And we need to take our hats off, especially to the young sisters who have been the primary leaders of this, because in the breakdown of families, sisters have stepped forward to assume a prominent role uh, in organizing. But I want to give you a personal example and lead you with this because I have a suggestion, but you're only going to get so much of this suggestion. Some people that have been on the show have heard this before. This was 1971. And in 1971, I had moved out of the Black Freedom Movement into a group called the Afro-American uh, Institute that became Pan-African People's Organization. Brother Mainu is familiar with the, this group. In fact, uh, he attended Kwanzaa and spoke at our Kwanzaa uh, this year, this last year. Uh, so we trained people in martial arts and we had two black belts, uh, both coming out of Vietnam, trained in Taekwondo, which is a kicking style of martial arts. And we were trained in combat martial arts. So we were in contact. We were fighting each other all the time. And these guys were so bad that they would rent a barn in the Hunter's Point and all the black belt, the black black belts would get together and fight it out. These are some street brothers. They bad. And for me, a good trainer is someone that can fight. So um, we did our training in the Hunter's Point. We had a group of uh, men in our group called Simbas, means lions. They're trained in karate. And then we had within that group, people trained in counterinsurgency because we had engineers in our group. We had people who came straight out of prison. Uh, you know, we had people from a cross-sectional life, a few of my uh, former students or current students then. And so we're training and suddenly we hear a noise some people who have been on the show before have heard this, but most of you haven't, and I'm telling you this for a reason. And so we go outside, and we had a guy named Spencer Tippins who was guard on the door, and a cop had him in a chokehold. A chokehold can kill you, you know? And so I'm not one to do stupid. And when I make a move, I usually know how to win. And in this particular case, this was a dangerous move. I instantly decided we're going to stop this and instantly knew what the percentage was, about 80-20. There's a 20% chance that someone could get killed. But the way we were trained, it shouldn't be us. So I ordered immediately all our symbols, the 10 of them, to surround the cops. And then I beckoned to them to close in because these cops um, wanted to go for their guns. We're trained in how to disarm you. We had to be close enough to get to your gun. And so the cops were trying to move to the police car. Now, the key thing in this situation was that these symbols had gone through the six-fold stages to mental freedom. We had taken them through eight months of orientation. They were disciplined. They were organizers. And they were all very smart. They all had their own minds. We didn't brainwash them. Some groups Everybody followed the leaders thinking. Now everybody thought for themselves. So I know they were thinking, oh shit, <laughs> got me in this situation. <laughs> so we had them surrounded. What we had going for us was discipline and we had martial arts. We didn't have any guns. Now had these cops had a gun out, 
then there's nothing we could have done other than talk. They didn't have their guns out, we could do more. And so as we closed in on him, I said, his name is Mr. Spencer Tippins. Say to him, please, Mr. Spencer Tippins, take your hands off of him and he'll give you whatever information you want and you better not put your hands on him anymore. And so they tried to enter that car because there's a shotgun in that car. There's a call for backup in that car. And they figured they could also pull their guns if they could get away. You know what I mean? So he took his hands off and he said, please, Mr. Spencer Tippins. And then after that, because there wasn't any information he wanted, that was a breakdown to teach us a lesson. Because we're in the Hunter's Point. Our base is the Fillmore. They're telling us, you come here, we're going to beat you down anytime you want to. Our message was, you better not. And so they jumped in that car and drove off. My black belt said, you could have got us killed. I said, you black belts talking that shit? Excuse my language. I said, you didn't get killed, did you? I said, the percentages were pretty good with us. And had they gone for their gun, if people didn't go for their training, they were dead. You know what I mean? So uh, then I told them to leave. Get out of there because reinforcements are coming. So for two weeks, we didn't go back. After two weeks, the cops never bothered us again. Now, there's a point I want to make here, and it's this. You can't always do this stuff. I'm not suggesting that you do this stuff. And, you know, when you're looking at situations where crowds of blacks are watching cops doing a brother in, those crowds are not organized. They're not disciplined. And so there's not going to be any kind of command or anything else people are going on. And who knows what they're going to do. And had my people been nervous and act all funny, they could have triggered the cops to do something. But my key point is this. You need to control the streets you live on. And wherever you have people who are organized, they can do that. And don't ask me stupid questions about how do you do it. <laughs> don't get dumb. You know what I mean? Because different situations call for different responses. But I'm saying this, this stuff needs to stop. And there's a lot of ways to stop it. And if you can't completely stop it, minimize it. And part of what these young people are doing is part of it. But that ain't the whole answer. You need to control the streets you live on and control what happens on them. And that isn't just against the police. You got these young girls who are being kidnapped and put into uh, sexual rings, sexual slavery, right in our community. Police are not doing anything. You expect the police to do anything? You better do something. But again, if you control the streets you live on, you know what's going on in those streets. So that's, that's my comment. But my main comment is our sadness goes out to the family of Tyree Nichols, to his mother, to his stepfather who had helped him get a job at FedEx, which is like the post office for young people now, at least pays fairly good. It's a beautiful family as our families are. And our hearts go out to them and um, to all the brothers and sisters who are struggling because of people. And when I say struggling, fighting. If you're oppressed, you're supposed to be fighting. Everything else is secondary. You hear me? People watching this show, that's why I started the show. And you're going to see some activists coming on this show, young activists, because some of them say they ain't young because they're in their 40s, some of them in their 30s. But you're going to see some young activists coming on here. That's where my heart is. Scholarship and fighting, baby, and spirituality. Praise the Lord and pass whatever you need. And that includes the ammunition. So let's get into this show. Um, Brother Menu Ampin, uh, whose topic is the origin of ancient Kuss discovered through primary research. I just want to remind you for people who... Uh, haven't uh, viewed him before. Um, first of all, I regard you, Maynu, as one of our best scholars. And uh, the reason is because you put your total self into your work. That's the main thing. And you're an activist scholar in that 
your research is used and shared in the community. You're always coming back and giving people reports on what's going on and everything else. And you come from an activist background because your father, Kofi, who's a friend of mine and who was active in Buffer, Black United Front for Educational Reform, who you and him are the same size, obviously genetically, there's something there, <laughs> but he's, he's Afrocentric. And um, I know that he's the one who encouraged you to get off into African-centered studies, black political, historical, social, and other. He had books on top of books. And so in the true tradition of African people, the family has been your first classroom and has got your black butt grounded. You know what I mean? <laughs> so Kofi, beautiful brother. Beautiful brother. Now, uh, brother uh, Menu Ampin got his master's degree from Morgan uh, State University in history and Africana studies. That's a black college. Um, and um, he sent me as his master's thesis, the thesis on Martin Luther King, the revolutionary Martin Luther King. He's been on the show before. He is the authority on King because he's got the true King. All this other stuff on King is pure bull. It's just a <laughs> rattling off the data that you already knew and some of it distorted. But his stuff, it's the best stuff going and I know he's gonna put that in a book. Uh, he's been teaching at Contra Costa uh, College since 2006. Now we had a conversation a number of times before he got this job and I said, Mainu. <laughs> It's very important that you're able to eat. Get a job. I know he didn't do this because of me. I know that's where he was headed anyway. But I didn't want to see him, one of these broker than a joke black folks out there with all kind of knowledge and don't know how to get a cent to pay the rent. And Maynu does that. So he's been teaching there uh, since 2006. And um, he's... Uh, He's in history and anthropology, ethnic studies. He's co-chair of ethnic studies. And um, he's co-chair of Africana uh, and African-American studies uh, at uh, Contra Costa, where the former chair was my former student, Carolyn Hodge, and they were a tag team, meaning they fought together against all the mess going on there. And Carolyn <laughs> used to roll her babies into my class uh, they were like three and four years old. And Carolyn was a senior uh, person coming into my class. She was in her late 30s, probably. And uh, then she got her degree, a BA uh, in Black Studies and a master's in Ethnic Studies. And I think she also had a BA with a concentration in La Raza Studies. And so the two of them uh, tag team out there at Contra Costa until Carolyn retired. And now Maynou has taken over that responsibility. So, but he's also an author of a book on uh, ancient African history, which uh, he can give you the title of. And um, he is constantly running to Africa doing his field work. And before that, he was in the libraries all over the world going into primary field work. So this is a brother, when he documents stuff, he's got the facts. So Maynu, ha, your pleasure, brother. Yeah. Well, thank you, brother. To, uh, to shock, I appreciate the, the intro and being back on your, on your program. And I also appreciate the intro as well because scholarship without application is useless. So we always have to look at what's happening in the community and hold criminals accountable and make them personally liable and also have a national registry for police criminals so that they can't go from one district to another and that they pay a career price as well. Plus, we got to challenge the police unions and the fraternal order of police who protect criminals. So I appreciate your intro because these are things that must be uh, dealt with if we're going to stop this kind of uh, open murder on black folks. So the key is that we got to legalize being black. We got to make right. our enemies legalize being of African descent. So 
as I do my work in scholarship, you know, the past and present, we link them because the present has no context unless we link it to the past. And we certainly can't go to the future unless we have a firm foundation and a, a, grand, a grand view of our experience. So I've just returned from, from Africa with a couple of trips in uh, 2020. I took a educational group to Kemet, but I went back this past winter to do uh, ongoing field work on the origins of ancient Kush. So I spent time in the rural areas, the remote areas in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in uh, uh, I went to Kemet again, but also South Sudan. So I'm really pleased to be able to do this important work in the field that I call Kushology, or the study of ancient Kush. And very little work has been done on, on documenting this. People know about Egypt or Kemet, the real name, or Nubia. But you know those are distorted quite a bit. But there's so much more that needs to be known about the southern origins and ancient Kush. So I'd just like to kind of share an introduction with folks so they understand the kind of work that's done. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. You gotta you gotta do the work in the libraries. You gotta do the work in the museums. You have to do the work on the linguistic work, and you have to do spiritual work if you're going to get the most out of what happens or, or what you want to learn in the field. So I've been on the case now in pursuit of the origins of ancient Kush since the uh, early 90s when I began to focus on this. So what I'd like to do is just share some slides and a kind of an introduction so that the, the brothers and sisters watching can get an idea of the field work and then uh, as an introduction and then, you know, in there so we could, could dialogue. And so um, I'm not sure. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I think I can move it. So, so uh, the Southern origins of ancient Kush discovered through primary research. And when we say primary research, we mean firsthand research. We go directly to the source. And that's what I, I've been doing now for more than three decades. And I'm pleased that, as, uh, as uh, Tashaka mentions, I'm pleased to have a family foundation with my mother, my late mother, uh, Mama Rosie Jones, and my father to provide a foundation, as well as all of the support in the community to help me to make a contribution that um, I'm designed and I came here to do. This is part of my life's work and mission, but it's nothing more important than primary uh, research. So my work is not to regurgitate what anybody else has said in the past because most of what's been presented has been a great distortion of facts. So Kush is the oldest of these advanced civilizations. And as um, the Shaka said on different programs, uh, we certainly agree and uh, that the early foundation of the small stature of the folks, the Twa, the uh, Mbuti, the Ife, the Bakwa, all of these small stature groups, they taught us what it meant to be human. So what I'm focusing on is not the origins of civilization, but the origins of high level advanced civilizations, the difference. So they're building on the earlier foundation of those who taught us the great uh, egalitarian cultures and what it, what it meant uh, to be human. So, um, yeah, I guess you probably, okay. So um, this is the book um, that uh, I recently wrote, A History of African Civilizations. And I, this is what I teach in my courses at Contra Costa College, but clearly it doesn't really make sense to just teach it in the academy within the four walls of academia, as opposed to also to make it available to the community. And I, I decided to put the greatest of all the Kushite builders, uh, Taharka, on the cover because he's the greatest builder in the history of Kush. Everywhere we look in the Nile Valley in Northeast Africa, we see the DNA. We see the fingerprints of the great builder himself, Taharka. He's Kushite. So if you read that someone says he's Nubian, he's not Nubian. Nubian is a great culture to the great people. I have great relationship with Nubian brothers and sisters, but we're talking a little bit further up south to really look at uh, Kush. And so um, uh, this, this field of Kushology is a term that I have uh, uh, have coined, Kushology, or the study or the systematic study of ancient Kush, because people have not looked enough at ancient Kush, which originates in the southern area. We have to go up south to places like South Sudan and northern Kenya and Uganda to really look at the origins of ancient Kush. So the so the study of Kushology. Um, this is something absolutely important. And we've had earlier scholars to speak about Kush or what the Greeks call Ethiopia, but I decided that 
that foundation of our earlier scholars, whether it's uh, Drusilla Dungey Houston or um, William Leo Hansberry or his student, Dr. Chancellor Williams or John G. Jackson, they definitely made a contribution. So I'm acknowledging that I'm building on their work by doing the systematic primary or first-hand research. And it's absolutely rewarding to be able to do so as a part of my mission. So I, I won't go into the details here, but a couple of things that should be pointed out, a few things that we have to reconceptualize the entire history of the region because the foreigners, they come in from the north and they've rewritten the history of Africa. That's why most people, when I say going up south, they say, well, do you mean down south? No, no, no. The orientation is wrong. That as you go in the southern area from Egypt to Sudan, South Sudan, you're going up and uh, and not and not down. So the foreigners who come from Europe and other places, their point of view is very different. So they'll talk about down south and and up north, but in a in an African geographical context, that's not how it works. And now river flows from south to north because all rivers run downhill because of, of uh, physics. And that's just how it works. So if a person cannot get the geography straight or a map straight, they can't get history straight. So we have to look at the entire region and know that the origins come from the south and not the northern areas. So that's why we have to reconceptualize the entire history of the region. And uh, and also we, we have to rewrite the history because most of the the writings have been from colonial writers. White colonial writers have dominated the field of classical African civilizations. So we call them classical African civilizations, Kush, and then Nubia, and then Kemet, as opposed to simply ancient African civilizations, because classical means the highest rank, the highest class, the highest value, anything that has permanent and lasting value. That's what classical means. It's the, it's, it's the model, it's the prototype, it's the guide, it's the foundation by which everything else is judged. So we have taken this term classical African civilizations, and we don't allow the colonial scholars to call Greek and Rome the classical civilizations and leave everybody else out in the world. What do you mean classical civilization? There ain't nothing exclusive about European culture, but that's how it's presented. So we are reappropriating the term and making sure that we have people understanding classical African civilizations. And we have to challenge all these academic departments in the U.S. and the Western countries that have the classics departments that only focus on Europe. This is disrespectful. It has no historical basis for it. You, the Greek and Rome is not superior, but you do have classical African civilizations and these uh, contributions endure in monuments and great uh, traditions that still that still uh, survive today. And these great contributions in math and architecture and science and, and medicine. So we're talking about classical African civilizations from an inside perspective rather than an outside perspective. So we're dealing with the original records. One of the other, one of the issues and problems is that most people and most of the so-called scholars looking at this, they look at it from the point of view of a blatant racist, George Reisner who hated black skinned people, he hated Africans, and, and George Reisner did work in the area from 1907 to 1932 for a quarter century in Egypt and Sudan. And the further he went to the South, the more disdain he had for the people. So Reisner has systematically misrepresented the, 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 uh, the history of Kush. And today, this is amazing, 100 years later, a century later, people are still following a blatant racist who had absolutely no respect for black skinned people. And so he's created a chronology that doesn't fit the record. And so this is why it's very important to go beyond this kind of propaganda. And so, um, but these are some of the things that have to be done uh, to reconceptualize, understand the significance of Kush, but it, but there's nothing more significant than, than um, field research. And that's really important. Here's a map that we created with our Save Nubia project. And uh, this is based on an original map, uh, editing and uh, of a map that was created by none other than the researcher, primary researcher, Chancellor Williams, who did work in the 1950s among, uh, uh, um, you know, various uh, African, uh, 26 African countries and 105 different language groups. And he created a map of what he called the Ethiopian Empire, but he's really describing the Kushite empire so based on my field work in the area here for more than 30 years i believe that we can successfully present a strong case that this would have been and was the region of kush and you can see the inset here on the top right 
So Kush, the heartland was centered in current day Sudan, but it, in, it, it encompassed this entire region. So what I had learned is that you can't just go to Egypt to know the full story of Kush. I learned you can't just go to Sudan. So I started to go uh, south and southeast to know the real story of ancient Kush because that's when we, uh, so Sudan has been very important for my research, but I learned uh, some years ago that that would get me a pretty good understanding and it will help me to understand uh, a lot about uh, Nubia and Kemet, but it doesn't tell the whole story about Kush. So my recent work in the winter of 2022 was to, uh, to encompass more of the Southern region. So this is what I've been concentrating on now for a number of years to not just spend time in Sudan, but a few months, a couple months ago, I was in South Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, and I'll continue to work in this region because it's all about discovering the Southern origins of ancient Kush through the primary or firsthand research. So this is an area where uh, I'm opening up. You know, people have gone there before, but my work is really to talk with the chiefs, the kings, the elders and a group of people that they call in the region heroes, cultural heroes that help protect and promote the culture. And so this has been my work. It's not sponsored by any government affiliations. It's not sponsored by the campus. This is my own original uh, research. And it's part of the contribution that I'm making to help us to tell the story of the origins of advanced civilization in the area from uh, primary research. Um, and so uh, here's one of the highlights I want to point out. In South Sudan, this was the last uh, stop on my tour this past winter. And I was fortunate enough to make all of the necessary connections and deal with Elder Abraham Gum. And this is an elder that I connected with about four years ago when I was in the region. And he was able to organize a group of, and what you're looking at here is a group of Dinka elders. This is in South Sudan in the capital of Juba. Now these elders, they come from the rural areas in, um, in South Sudan, but we were able to gather 11 elders. And among the, the 11, there were uh, there five chiefs um, among, uh, uh, among this group. So, sorry, there, there's 11 uh, of chiefs, but among these chiefs, there's five uh you know, regional chiefs, and then there's two paramount chiefs. So these are the people that have the most exceptional insight about Dinka culture. And so um, when I started my interview with this group of elders, I was surprised because I've had a lot of fortunate experience to meet with important um, elders and important people. And usually we meet them in the remote areas in the village, but in this case, they happened to just be in the capital of Juba, so it, it, it was fortunate. But something happened when I asked them about the culture and their ideas, these brothers stood up. They, they stood up, but you know what they did? They sang two songs. They sang, uh, luckily I had my camera ready because I didn't have my film crew with me at the time, but I, they stood up and I had to make sure I got my camera ready to document this, and they sang two songs, and these songs were traditional Dinka songs to say to me that we accept your questions. So it was a formal acceptance of me uh, asking them detailed questions about their culture and subculture because these brothers, like others, they don't just trust anybody. You don't just go in and start having interviews. It doesn't happen that way. So they have to know that you're legitimate. So I make it clear to them that I'm an African that lives in America, but my mission is to help to document their traditional beliefs and culture because uh, it is part of this ancient Kushite civilization of the past that continues in the present. And so when I share things with them, they're really stunned that I'm showing them images and depictions from antiquity that clearly demonstrate that they have not changed their practices much at all even though they're not familiar with those images and pictures that I showed them until I showed them. So they, uh, you know, they wished me well, but that was one of the great moments when they sang the songs uh, to say, we, we accept your question. Usually people just say, hey, look, they tell the translator, yes, um, we accept him. Thank you for coming. No, they sang their traditional songs. So I was honored by that. Now notice this here. Um, I did not ask this. 
You know, they wanted to show me respect as I was documenting our meeting. They wanted me in the middle. I said, I don't want to sit. I don't want to sit in front of the, the elder brothers. You know, I can sit on the side or, or stand behind. They said, no. And I said, I don't want to block anybody because it's kind of odd. So they made me literally. I couldn't resist. They made me sit in the front as a way to show uh, respect. And uh, because they haven't really had an experience where a brother who respects them, who uh, and, you, and has a similar views and values as they do, are coming to help preserve their culture. And we had some very deep discussions about Dinka values and uh, and how they see the world. And these brothers uh, gave gave it up. One of the other things that I was looking at when I was there is not only their ceremonies around funerals and marriages and uh, and births and um and the harvest time but i also wanted to know about specific cultural practices like the embracing of the leopard skin for rituals and ceremonies why the leopard you know and i ask all the groups the same thing what's valuable about the leopard and they give great insight i also ask these elders and others why is the the ostrich which is an african bird why is this so significant and important so I learned quite a bit as I went from group to group. But with this group, you can't really see it. I would have to show uh, you know, some other photos. But I asked this group of the, among the chiefs to please take off your, your, your hat, if you would, because I wanted people to see the cultural markings across the forehead. You can't see it too much. But um, here you, uh, you can see just a little bit. But these are not, I don't call it scarification because that kind of has a negative uh, connotation, but they have the cultural markings to link them to their group. And in talking about the origins of different practices, um, the elders told me that they believe, this is why it's important to do field work, they believe that it's the British that introduce the cultural markings so they can distinguish one group from another. And this is more of a modern uh, practice. And so I listened to them and, and then I listened to uh, other elder uh, say the same thing. And then I said, well, that's that's interesting. It's interesting insight. And I would say that if the British, if they did come in and try to enslave the Dinka, and by the way, these brothers told me with great emphasis, the world needs to know that we're human beings. Then they also said, people need to know that we're not slaves. And I thought about it. I said, you know what? The, the same with us in the US. We're not just some slaves. I said, that's what we have in common. So everybody was laughing. <laughs> we got that in common. We're human beings. And just because our... Um, our lighter skinned enemies enslaved us uh, among black folks in the U.S. and then uh, Dinka culture. Uh, we're more than that. So we, we had that in common. But uh, they said that the sort of British came in and tried to enslave the Dinka. OK, yes. But I also told them this. I appreciate their insight. I said, but the British did not create the cultural markings because they existed long before that. So when I showed them images of the cultural markings with the clear lines across the forehead thousands of years ago, it's like, whoa, that's how they uh, they were stunned by that. So what's special for me uh, to be out in the field is to learn from our brothers and sisters, to observe the cultural practices and ceremonies, but also share useful ideas with them. And actually what, com what came out of this with the Dinka, for example, is that I'm going to be co-publishing with one of the brothers who uh, who's written about the local cultures. He knows the modern cultural practices today, and I know the ancient period, so we're going to partner up. So Dr. Mayar El Mayar, who's a very uh, talented brother, I was glad to meet him. But I just wanted to share that. Um, but this culture markers are so important. Here, I was talking to uh, uh, to, to brother uh, to Shaka before we we started. And you know we were mentioning the importance of the spiritual tradition, and this is always a part of my work in the field is to know about the rituals, the ceremonies, and um, those spiritual practices. So most of the groups, including the Dinka, this man here, he is um, he's a Dinka elder, but he's a spiritual chief. A lot of times we know about political chiefs. He's a spiritual chief, a coot, a coot. Uh, Mayom is his name. So he's a spiritual chief. And so his discussion about the rituals and ceremonies around the leopard skin and the ostrich feather was immensely insightful because he's looking at it from the point of view of a spiritual chief who looks at the rituals, ceremonies, and, and uh, the divination uh, practices. So, in the, so that's South Sudan. I spent time also 
in not only in the Nile Valley the, in 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 South Sudan, but in the Omo Valley in Ethiopia. This is a, a, another special region if we really want to know about the significance of Kush and the significance of these cultural groups that still practice the same ceremonies and rituals. And these are in very remote areas, very remote. So here you see me with the chief on the left and you see the brothers behind us. They're not, um, they're not using the, the chalk to uh, make up their faces and bodies for tourists. No, not at all. This is their normal uh, practices, and they all have significance. As a matter of fact, the Shaka said, uh, "said man, no, you uh, you should have uh, <laughs> remember that you, you, the, the, you should have uh, also been made up." I said, "You know what, Doc? That's a good point. I'm going to do that next time." But what I did this time, I had my driver uh, that they made him up. So next time, I'm going to be made up too, and we're going to take the group there. But it's important to learn from the. So what I learned too in doing the field work, and you learn as you go. I learned that we have to look for special people, a chief, a king, uh, elders, or the, uh, the 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 heroes. Because as my colleague says, when we're in the Omo Valley, when we talk to young people, they give us, and I like his description, they give us broken information. I said, brother, you're right. It is broken. It's not complete. So even when I was meeting with the, uh, the Dinka elders, for example, they were explaining a, a very special small bird that's centered around their culture. And then one of the young brothers who means well, he said, yeah, flamingo. And I said, no, no, brother, flamingos are big birds. They could not have been talking about that. Then he mentioned uh, a pelican or some other big, I said, no, no, no. So then one of the other translators also corrected him, but he's a good brother, but guess what? He's young. He's trying, but you you know, you give him misinformation. Luckily, I know that uh, they could not have been talking about a big bird, but this is part of the work in the field. Um, to learn to spend time and not just do a hit and run video shoot. That's that's low level and it doesn't really teach anybody anything. Here's one of the highlights. As I was talking about the rituals and ceremonies, this king, this chief here on the left, um, he's he's a DZ chief, D-I-Z-I. -I, and this is in the um this is in the Omo National Park area where these indigenous groups live. And as I was asking questions about the fundamental characteristics of the leopard, which is the single most important big cat, not the lion. It's the leopard that's the fundamental uh, cat of importance. And as I asked them about why the leopard, and they give tremendous insight about the fundamental characteristics, this chief went into his compound that you see behind us and brought out an actual leopard skin that he uses in rituals and ceremonies. And we were told when we started the interview that that uh, that nobody can touch him, and only certain people can go into his compound. So he's highly respected because of his deep knowledge about the culture. And the next thing I know, he came out with one of the most important items for a ritual ceremony, which is still being practiced today, not only in the Omo Valley but in the entire region. And it does link back to Kush. And so, um, you know, these are the kind of experiences that give me exceptional insight about uh the cultural ways so uh that's that's what i want to share for now i mean I, I i could share many other things um in fact let me just end by saying this many of you know about the so-called black pharaohs and i'll just show a couple slides and i'll be done but this is a misrepresentation by foreigners it's propaganda to say that in the 25th dynasty in the 8th century bce that these are the only and the first so-called black pharaohs what they mean to tell us is that the first 24 dynasties were not black or African pharaohs. This is propaganda. So when this came out with, on the front cover of National Geographic and books published related to the black pharaohs and academic papers published related to the black pharaohs, this is all propaganda. You don't talk about the white rulers of Greece or the white rulers of Rome. We assume that they're white and of European origin. Why is it qualifying uh, description of color related to Kush? Because it's to mislead and misinform and misdirect the public. So I don't follow any of this crazy nonsense because it's not accurate. So to challenge all of this craziness, we got to look at the actual uh, records and not the modern interpretation. So I just want to share with you, all of you are probably pretty familiar with the Louvre Museum in Paris. And here are some of the best mainstream Egyptologists in the world. And to show you that they don't know what they're talking about. They've stolen the African symbol, as you can see, 
They had the glass pyramid there. But when you go downstairs into the Louvre, here's the misrepresentation that takes place. You go into the gallery on Kemet, and as you walk through the gallery, the, sorry, the, gal the gallery, they have these images that you see here. So these are the foreign nations to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And you can see the middle group here, they're identified in the uh, description as Nubian. <coughs> these individuals here, and guess what? They're not Nubians at all, but these are sort of experts making something up because they don't know what they're talking about. So, for example, um, how do we know when they're not newbies? Well, you have to look at the cultural markings, the the dress, the attire, the hairstyle. Then you can tell one group from another, and that's what I now am able to do with um, with a pretty good insight about it now. But you have to continue to study and learn these things. But these are not newbies because take a look here. If you take a closer look, you see that the artists in, in, in carving this, they have the culture markings. You see the lines? There's one, that's two, there's three. There's four lines going across. This is not Nubian uh, culture markings. These are culture markings of those from South Sudan. You know, And so now I know that you know, so a lot of the New Air say, yeah, these are New Air. But now I know that it's even more um specific than that you can have markings across the forehead that look identical but you can't only look front side you got to look from the profile and see how these how far these markings go back towards the ear in order or or the specific angle of the markings that indicate one group from another but these markings here indicate that these that this has nothing to do with nubia but this goes all the way back to George Reisner, who was systematically misrepresenting the people because he had disdain for black skinned people. So he only was was willing to give up the fact that some were Nubian. But, it, but Reisner did not go beyond that. But he was as viciously racist as we've seen. Um, and he's not just a person of his time. Not everybody's a bigot and a racist like he was, but he certainly was. And he had a warped thinking, you know. And let me just show you one last thing. This is a tomb in Sakar, the tomb of Hormheb, and he's getting his gold collars. This is the um, Lifetime Achievement Award. And if you look at this, the wall reliefs in the tomb of Hormheb, this is now in Egypt, in Kemet, uh, you take a look at how clever the artists were. And you can see the different stages of the cultural markings. The man right here in the middle, you see five men. Notice that they're red. That's because these are fresh cuts. And then you notice the man to the left of him, the cuts are not quite as fresh and then you see so you see for some you see fresh cuts but look how look to the man second from the right notice that these markings have healed so we can tell who the people were based on the culture markings and not only that but also the hairstyle so when this was painted the head hair would have been red so who has red hair who does that well, the the uh, the Dinka, the Nuer, the in the um, the Mandari, they dye their hair. It's red or sometimes it's uh, yellow because they use cow urine, and they put the cow urine on the on the hair. And after a week or so, it changes colors. So, so anybody saying that these are Nubians or something? No, no. Look, Nubian people were great in the past, and they're great now. But we're talking about not allowing people to misidentify African groups that we clearly can identify based on the cultural representation. That's part of the work that I've been doing to learn about the uh, the Kush, uh, the civilization in Kush. So that's all I want to share um, as a foundation. And then just lastly, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some groups this summer so that uh, people can learn um, as well. So this will be one of the educational tours. And then after this one to Kemet in June, then there'll be a 16 day tour to Ethiopia as well. So uh, so that's what I wanted to share, Doc, as a, a, a just as an introduction. Okay, beautiful. Um, so let me just make a few comments and then you can go into the various areas that you went in and the comments you wanna make on that. I thought that uh, your comment about uh, classical civilization in this case classical African civilization is important and uh, the distinction that you made in terms of high level and uh, monumental uh, in certain cases. So um, 
I think that's extremely important because what's happened with European um, classifications of civilization, they have basically defined civilizations as first of all, stratified societies eh? mm. and usually urban, uh, at least having an urban base. They may have a rural base uh, as well. And because they're using their own definition um, for you know, their own societies, they impose this on the world, usually patriarchal and warlike. And those are usually also features of civilization. And so you'll see sometimes when we um, do something on African civilization, like Wakanda and stuff like that, we've got people struggling over kingship based on power. That never happened, you know? Because as I pointed out in the last show, there was the best man tradition, the person who was most just, most kind, most brave, um, the one who never cursed, the one that respected elders, that respected women, um, the one who never turned his back on a war party, the, the one that never brought dishonor to himself in his entire life. And you came out of societies where you couldn't come up with some false campaign narrative. In fact, you couldn't campaign. It was the best man that was picked. And I pointed out, women didn't have to be the best of being queen mothers. They didn't have to go through any requirements. The men did. So that should tell you the power of women. And there were a check on the men through a male-female balance. So um, stratification has generally been their basis for defining civilization. And then, of course, art, architecture, and any other things that are indication of creativity, which is at a low level, particularly in current level societies that call themselves civilizations i.e. European. In fact, some of the stuff they call art is a pure joke. A <laughs> tomato can is art. <laughs> you go and look at some of these things. It's, it's a painting of blue. That's art. And somebody paid a million dollars for that. Hell, I could paint that. <laughs> My wife used to sell rocks to tourists in uh, Barbados. You know what I mean? She could have told them it was art. You know what I mean? And it was because it's coming from nature. You know? So... Uh, the first thing is on civilization, classical, um, that the key in terms of African civilizations is, starting with the Chua, but all others that develop out of it, the key central feature of civilization is a balance between males and females. That feature of civilization, whether it's the Chua, which give birth to it, that I call twin lineal, or it's the... Um, Societies that Chancellor Williams studied in destruction. And by the way, his best work is Rebirth of African Civilization. We went into Ghana in the 50s and interviewed thousands of Ghanaians. And then uh, with the help of other Ghanaians, thousands more on one question, what kind of society do you want uh, at independence? And this was in the 50s when Nkrumah was waging a struggle for independence and Nkrumah supported this. Uh, so uh, he studied these societies. And, and so these are civilizations. And in the case of the Chua, they give birth to high tech. In other words, their idea of God is physics, the um, infinite force outside of space and time, a part of which is distributed to everything God created. That's physics, baby. And I would say it's a higher definition even than the noon in Kemet, where uh, Ptah comes out of the noon, a watery mass, and um, it's said that the noon precedes God, Pata. Um, but the noon is described as electromagnetic like energy. It's watery light, which is the first substance that we find, or the primary substance on Earth. We are uh, the same percentage of water as just about everything else, as Mother Earth, you know, 75%. So, um, that at the base of our definition of civilization is the quality of the relationship between males and females. And then it's the creativity that we distribute or, you know, uh, you know, display. Uh, and, and by the way, what we call art is an art because the stuff that's beautiful, like I was in, in the two shows that I did on the Anu, Founders of Kemet, I was showing you 
ancient great Anu uh, society pottery. That pottery had a spirit role, number one. It was used for offerings to the gods. But number two, the uh, carvings themselves had a spirit role. Everything in Africa had a spirit foundation. So when you interviewed um, one of the kings who was a spirit person, uh, that's at the core of the society. So uh, stratification on different levels. So some societies like dynastic Kemet also creates monuments. But if you look at the um, ancient period that Europeans incorrectly call pre-dynastic, because how could it be pre-dynastic if the first dynasty started there with a Tsar and he ruled upper and lower uh, societies that I call the societies of the great ones, that was their name. But prior to that, at least 10,000 BC, the Sphinx was built. You wanna talk about monuments? That's the monument of monuments. And the Kemites uh, dynasty couldn't tell you very much about them other than that they knew they came from their people. And look at the face, you know, it's the face of an African. Dr. Finch is coming up with a book where he, where he argues, as I pointed out in a previous show, that these, uh, this Sphinx is a woman. And if that's the case, that's consistent with this twa twin lineal thing. When you go to the agrarian period, where it's male-female balance and the hunter-gatherer, it's male-female balance inclining towards the female when you first go into agriculture. So it's reasonable to assume, as I went into in some previous shows, that women play a big role because they're transitioning out of Paleolithic or Stone Age into agriculture. And who's the agriculturalist? Women. <laughs> so if you want to talk about the level of civilization you're looking at the level of the woman and then the interaction between males and females. Second point, cultural markings. Um, some people call them country marks. Those are scarifications of initiation. Those are indicating levels generally because with some people who are in Islam, they just may do the scarification and not any longer have a connection to it. But generally throughout Africa, when, when Africans were brought into this country, they had country marks because uh, what's called, you know, scarification or marks, because it recorded the level of your initiation. That's the African system of education. That's the mystery system of education. So those marks would tell you the power of the person, the level of knowledge that they actually had. And that's all over Africa, you know? It's not just for beauty. And, and you know, it's considered beautiful, but it is for uh, telling you who this person is. And they had to go through trials to get that. The third thing, the leopard skin. The earliest example of the leopard skin is found among the Twa. And the leopard skin is worn by the greatest healers among the Twa. This goes back at least 150,000 years. They were doctors. They were healers. Now, later on, maybe chiefs take this because remember in Kemet, the pharaoh is also chief priest. And so he's playing a healing role. That was a SARS role. And so in Kemet, the leopard skin was worn by the priest who were doctors. That was who wore the leopard skin. So the leopard skin is uniform. But that's because there's an underlying foundation of African civilization that they all draw from that happens to be Trois-based, and then it's taken to other levels. So, you know, I just wanted to uh, add those. But, you know, I think that your emphasis on dealing with the civilizations not covered, Kush, very important, because you're going back to the roots. You're old school, old new, you know. You're going back to the tradition. And uh, so drawing on uh, our old scholars like Chancellor Williams, uh, Drusilli Dungy Hurston and others, that's going back to foundation stuff that they saw to be extremely important. And you're now doing primary research to bring that out and document it. Because if Africa is gonna get its act together and if we're gonna get our act together in this country and around the world, we got to draw from the best of our past. And these cultural traditions 
are extremely important. And your emphasis on elders, the elders are the history book of Africa. They're the memory of Africa. They're the wisdom of Africa. And it's true for us here as well. We're in a society that doesn't honor elders, but they go back to the very beginning. Their knowledge does. And it's Absolutely. found knowledge. So you hook it up with them and you can't go anywhere in Africa on a village level unless you get their permission. Absolutely. It's yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and just to, to add to what you mentioned also about civilization, this is very important because because the traditional definition of civilization it's limited and we challenge it. So people don't always define it. Um, but typically they mention or, or refer to like five elements. So it's, it's definitely a stratified society, but it's writing. Any society has writing and metallurgy, farming, uh, a central government, and then also, um, you know, cities or urban areas. And so because they looked around and say, hey, look, we can define Greece and Rome as so-called civilized because they have these five elements. The problem is that these only relate to things. So what you have these things doesn't make you, doesn't give you any humanity. So a more important definition that I've been using for quite a while for civilization to challenge the traditional one is, uh, is, a, is, is peaceful and harmonious relations among people and between people and their environment so that they have ethical and ecological laws. And so this is really the basis of so-called civilization and that at the root of civilization is civilized or civil conduct. And this is why this alternative understanding and definition is important, because otherwise we'll think that things matter. No, it's the quality of the relationships among the people. And that has to be a definition of civilization because it deals with the civil interaction, civil, harmonious, peaceful interaction. So I always put big emphasis on that so that we can define terms and, and define the perspective we're looking at and not just follow the assumptions of foreigners who are only going to look at things. You have people like Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, systematic cannibal in America, but he could write very well. He could dress well. What does that have to do with the civilized conduct? It doesn't, but this is how people write out the indigenous Africans uh, who taught us uh, harmonious civil, so-called civilized conduct. They get written out because they don't have a writing system. They get written out because they don't farm. So I so said, you got to be careful. And then when they're written out and dismissed, then they have to fight to protect their very survival. This is why the small stature folk, they live in remote areas for safety, whether it's deserts or rainforests or islands, places like that, because they're not aggressive. That's not their culture. And so um, they live in these places of refuge in order to maintain their culture. This is why it's so important when people go to the continent it's okay to go and do what people do. But for me, it's more important to get the authentic history and be among people in the more remote areas because when people go to the cities, they conform. They have to conform. And governments make it, like, for example, I was showing the Dinka markings. It's been banned. Uh, these cultural markets have been banned for decades in South Sudan, that they don't want people to continue with the cultural markings. They don't want the people to take out the lower teeth during uh, the rituals uh, into adulthood. So, um, but these practices link them to their culture and it's definitely about initiating folks into the culture. And if you don't go through that, you're not considered an adult. That's just how it is. That's how we see things. But our own definitions are so crucial and critical to us having an authentic, original understanding about African uh, cultural and traditional practices. This is why we have to relook at and reinterpret what's been dumped on us by the the docudramas that come out with on the History Channel, National Geographic, and all these other uh, Discovery Channel, and it's just phony nonsense. So National Geographic is one of the great organizations in the world that have systematically distorted African history um, with their propaganda. So we cannot just rely on that. We got to either go out in the field to do work or support those that are doing the work so we can have our own independent, independent interpretation of our traditional values. Uh, two things I want to remind people of that someone had noted on the uh, screen. Hit the like button. Hit the like button. They've got us on these slow algorithms. So the more you hit the like buttons, you're going to generate more interest. The other thing is if you haven't subscribed, 
hit the subscriber button. And Maynu, before we go any further, could you remind people of and show them the book you've written? Yes. Of- okay. I could bring up my slides, but if folks can see this, A History of African Civilizations, this right. is my latest book. I'll be coming out with a second revised edition soon. This is Taharka. And so this is available. It's what I teach in the classroom. Not everything, but some of what I teach in the classroom, and it's available. So anybody can go to advancingtheresearch.org, advancingtheresearch.org, and you can order this. It's best to order it from us rather than giving Amazon all that um, revenue. Um, so advancingtheresearch.org, and the book is a history of African uh, civilizations. It's from my field work. Right on. It's, I should say uh, beautifully illustrated, artistically done, great paper that you use because you know we do publishing so i know something about this and i know it came out of your pocket to do this see this chance of williams people like Maynou and others um th- as he pointed out he's not being financed by any foundation what does that mean it means he's giving you the straight truth there's nobody filtering it there's nobody editing his stuff of course everybody that publishes doesn't mean that they have written something solid you got to have a solid ba- background. You've got a solid background. So, um, you know, you're getting real truth. And um, the only way um, the uh, major uh, forces out there, Amazon gets my books is through somebody else because you get my books through me. <laughs> right. I, I see all these different prices on my books. There are some where the mother principle is selling for a thousand dollars. I appreciate the compliment, but uh, I know that you're ripping people off. That book is $24.95, and it's new, and I'll sign it. You hear me? So quit going to them when you've got the black source. Cut it out. You know what I mean? Uh, just, Just one other comment before we get into some of the areas that you hit a little bit more. Reisner. Um, It's often said of uh, William Leo Hansberry, who was the dean of the study of ancient African history during his lifetime. He was the best researcher, period. And then when he died, his lecture notes were put into two volumes uh, on Ethiopia, uh, classical writers. They they were put together. Uh, He went to Harvard. He also went to Oxford. And neither place would they give him a PhD. Now, the reason they said was because his knowledge was too advanced. That wasn't why. It was because his knowledge contradicted the crap that they were putting out. Reisner was arguing that the Egyptians were white. And all William Leo Hansberry had to do was go back to the classical writers and cite them, starting with Herodotus and citing others, all of whom said they were black. And this is after... Blacks are no longer in power, and he's going along, he's giving them documentation of when they were in power. So they denied him because they didn't want to give him any more credibility to push forward a school of thought that was based on the truth. That was the reason. And he was, like you, uh, he studied prime, he he was in all of the places um, where they had documents, all of the libraries in Europe. He went to Africa and did his own research. And in my last interview with John Henry Clark, who I interviewed for eight months on the masters in his life, when I asked him, because the last one was on what he called his mature period, I've mentioned this before, but a lot of people here are new, they haven't heard this. He was very clear when I asked him, who was your master in your mature period, which in uh, the African-American system would be your improvisational period. This is what I'm covering in the book I'm finishing right now. Without a doubt, he screamed out, and he was dying, but he was very sharp mentally. He said, William Leo Hansberry. And then he went in. I had a three-hour interview with him. That was the time where we had decided we had found out that uh, Theophilo Benga was looking for a job, and I'd call Wade Nobles and we put out the word that we're going to bring him in. So uh, William Leo Hansberry, but again, he was into the Ethiopian. He was into the firsthand stuff. He was, he was one of our best, he was the best scholar at that time on African history in the world, period. 
and the John Henry Clark would study under him and then branch out into his own area of African history, which was broad, uh, following Leo Hansberry, and would go to Africa and live with people in the poorest areas of Ghana. I told you before, he saw Nkrumah when Nkrumah was doing a motorcade through a slum area of uh, Ghana, of Accra, and he stops his car, and suddenly soldiers start to surround uh, John Henry Clark, and Nkrumah says, no, 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 leave him alone. And then he asked John Henry Clark, what's your black ass doing in Africa? And he said, well, I'm here to study the history of our people. And he said, you must really love them because you're in the poorest part. And so he gave him a job, you know what I mean? So this is again, field research. John Henry Clark would live with the people because he came from the same poor African communities in the South, you know what I mean? So it was natural for him to mix with the people and see what was going on. So uh, getting back to uh, your areas, uh, is there more you want to say about uh, the Sudan? Yeah, just, no, I want to. I, I see a comment in the chat. Let me uh, correct something here or expand it. Uh, I think so. Appreciate all your your mm -hmm. comments. So uh, so so five star. I see that you mentioned uh, Brother Browder. Uh, understand that there is different field work that's done. My I've been doing field work in Kemet for more than thirty years, going to pyramid sites, temple sites tomb sites and ancient residential sites. When I first went in 90, I went to more than 42 sacred sites. So doing archeological work is a small part of what needs to be done. Uh, but I've been pioneering field work at remote areas that most people are not aware of in Kemet. So, I mean, they haven't even heard of it because only specialists are familiar with these, these locations. So understand that uh, when one is doing primary or first-hand research. We're not limited uh, to just one type of, of effort. So you have to know the language, interpret the language. You've got to do the work in the museums. You've got to go to the different archaeological sites. You have to go to the libraries, and you certainly must do spiritual work if you're going to understand the rituals. So let's be clear that, that um, you know, my work in the field in Kemet uh, stretches back decades into last century. This is why I'm able to now go further south to put a bigger uh, focus on the region and not only in Kemet. So, um, you know, so no one, if you want to look at it, that no one's doing specifically what I'm doing, going to the Omo Valley and the deeper part of the Nile Valley in order to understand the entire regional perspective. And that's important. So when I take groups to Kemet, for example, we go to 30% more places than any other group. The reason why is because I'm approaching it from the point of view of a primary researcher and a scholar and not simply, you know, the same old tours. So this is why we go to places that others are not quite familiar with. Not that other tours don't have value. They do. But, but my tour is unique because of the way I'm approaching it. We'll spend, look, we'll go uh, a, a quarter mile to look at one inscription. And I tell my group the same thing, that understand that you're not going to see anybody else around, either because their days are a lot shorter, uh, they want to go to the bazaar, or they're just not aware that over here, it may not be a spectacular site or, or area at the site, but it's one of the most important inscriptions in the history of the country. And you can only know that if you're doing the field research, because if you're just going on a regular tour, you're not, you don't really have time to explore every rock at each side of, of a monument and study. So I just wanted to share that that's how uh, we have to understand the significance of primary research and contributions that are made, because um, there are many that have to be made in different areas. Archaeology is just one. In fact, one of the problems with archaeology is that by definition it's destructive, because you're digging up something. And all these exhibits, like the King Tutu common exhibit or the Ramses, they're digging up sacred artifacts that no one gave permission for somebody to be digging up African bodies and raiding tombs and putting them on display. But that's what happens, you know, when, when folks go in and dig. So, um, you know, archaeology is one thing, but doing work at archaeological sites, as I do, I spend thousands and thousands and thousands of hours at archaeological sites not to dig up but to make the careful 
a microscopic assessment of each and every part of every monument that you can find. And that's how you're able to look at the broad connected view of each site. So I just wanted to share that, Doc. Yeah, and I think there's another point here that um, Western historians have generally not trusted Africans as the source of their own history. And so, for example, they put down oral history. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, That's a great point. <laughs> so what Mato is doing is he's going to the source. By the way, my PhD, I didn't get a PhD till after I was tenured. And the reason I didn't get one is that I had so little respect for so, most of the PhD holders who are functionally illiterate. You know what I mean? But I finally decided to, it was ba basically a challenge. But my PhD is in oral research. That's mine. And I was 52. So there wasn't a lot they were going to be able to teach me anyway. But I was bringing in stuff they didn't know about. So, you know, it became the basis for 400 page dissertation. You know what I mean? But the key point is the people. And so Menu is going to the people and he's getting it directly from them. And that's the key point. Just as if you're able to find a, a written source that goes way back, for example, then that is giving you a, an account of the orality put into writing. And so if you know how to read that, you've got the proper linguistic training, but cultural background, then you can translate it. But the oral, he's going to the people, the people know their own history. And by the way, in traditional African societies, the majority of Africa is oral, even though we gave birth to writing. And some of us act like we're ashamed of that. Well, um, the people had memories where, for example, if a person became a Muslim, they memorized the whole Koran. You don't know what memory really is until you get into an African thing. You know what I mean? And so um, in the African sources, what's called jelly um, in uh, West Africa, the French call them griots. There are two types, uninitiated, initiated. Initiated jellies who are historians, they are required to tell the truth. They can never lie. They can't do storytelling unless it's a story of the truth. And when they give an account of the history, there are other jellies sitting next to them. If they make a mistake, they're corrected. They're not allowed to make too many mistakes. And so they've been trained. And, and the historians of Africa are basically biographers. That is, they know the family lineage. Some of them, the greatest jellies in a particular society, know all the families in that society. And anytime someone dies, they're there to record the death as they are to keep a record of the life. And the jelly is the uh, person who speaks for uh, the king. And it's the jelly who sings praise songs. Jellies could become rich because one of the things kings are supposed to do is reward them with a lot of wealth for what they say. But they are the praise people, Oriki people in Yoruba. Oriki, praise prose but it's praise prose of history. So if you read Sunjata, the epic of ancient Mali, Sundiata, uh, that is the history of a jelly of Sundiata, the founder of the kingdom of Mali. And the only thing I found close to it in history in terms of beauty is Malcolm X on Afro-American history. It's absolute beauty because these jellies are also great speakers. And so when they sang, for example, uh, to Menu to recognize that they were, uh, you know, recognizing his right to ask questions, that's also the way in which Africans give you their most important messages through songs that also contain history. You know what I mean? So. Um, He's dealing with primary sources. You better realize that's important. And the best stuff that our people have written in this country, they've gone to the sources, whatever they're writing about. Um, there's a brother who wrote some very important stuff on the movement in the 60s. I Got the Light of Freedom. And um, that book, he went and interviewed 
huge number of people who made up the movement in Mississippi. That makes it a classic. You want to make any other comment on this oral text? Yeah, th this is one of the most important, as you indicate, areas of study, but it's minimized and dismissed by archaeologists because they don't respect the people. They don't want to hear from the people. They want to go and get an object and give their own uh, bias interpretation of, of how that artifact might have looked or what it means and dismiss the people and say that, well, it may not be accurate. It could change. What are you talking about? Your interpretation may not be accurate either. We don't just trust you. And besides, archaeologists disagree. Why? Because it's your opinion. And then from one school of archaeology, and then the next generation, they disagree with the previous generation. So ain't nothing special about that. But just to give the, 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 the viewers an idea of how it's important to do the firsthand original research and not rely on other people. Uh, like in Ethiopia, in the Omo Valley, there's a group called the Yangatong. The Yangatong in the Omo Valley in Ethiopia, I came across some uh, photographer who has a tremendous amount of influence because he goes to these areas in, uh, in Ethiopia and South Sudan, and he, he has some very, uh, very nice photographs. But his interpretation, as most interpretations are by foreigners, are very suspect. In fact, not only just foreigners, but even some of the brothers and sisters, the brothers themselves, they're quoting European authors. So I said, well, well, first of all, we don't have a lot to talk about. That's not my point of view. I'm here to do original work. But uh, this author, he said that the Yangatong, the name means the one who stinks. And I, so what did I do? So I went to my colleague. I knew this was nonsense. So I went to my colleagues from the Yangatong and uh, and uh, and who know the area well, and they were all surprised. I said, yeah, you see this kind of nonsense? And so the Yangatong doesn't mean that at all. It has to do with the ones who eat elephants. But this foreigner says the one who stinks. And then he gave some other misinformation, but he's followed pretty widely. And this is what happens. And one of the key questions I always have as I collect the oral history, is I start by um, the basic question, what do you call yourselves? Because others call you this and that. And you know what? More than half the time, I would say three out of four times, what they call themselves, their self-reference is fundamentally different than what other people call them. So we'll have a 10-minute discussion on what do you call yourself? Why do you call yourself that? Uh, why do others have a different name? Uh, or you used to use a different name. Why did you change? So it's a deep discussion. It could be longer, but we take 10 minutes to just focus on the name to make sure I have the right understanding of how they see things. And they're fundamentally, in most cases, a completely different view than what outsiders have to say. And so nobody can tell me anything about it because I'm getting directly from the most knowledgeable inside members of that society. And that's what's valuable. In fact, when I get it from the elders, and the, the chiefs and kings, then sometimes I even have to educate the younger people in that culture that, uh, well, it's a little bit more than that, young, young, <laughs> young brother. And they're surprised. So they want to know if I'm of their group. No, I'm not born of the group, but I've been in touch with those who are at the central uh, place of knowing about the group. And then that's when some of them, like one of the brothers, he, he, wants to, he said he wants to do what I'm doing. That is to go around and learn about his and other cultures in the Omo Valley. So we, we've we been dialoguing, and his only issue is that uh, he doesn't have enough opportunity to speak English, you know, and because it's hard. They don't always have the best internet. There's not a lot of tourists around to hear the language. So, but I, but I, but him and other people, they're going to be a part of my team because I, he's knowledgeable, he's humble, he, he can translate. And it's somebody that we trust. It must be based on trust, somebody we can go and who has credibility because otherwise we would never get the interview. We would never be allowed to go. Like, for example, some of it, Doc, to get the oral history and the stories, like I showed the DZ chief, what a journey. I mean, what a journey. We had to drive. you got to have an off-road vehicle that can get to these special places. And at some point, uh, you can't drive anymore. Now, you know what? You walk. You walk through the village. It's got dirt and hills and mounds and gravel and mud and a, whole, a stream and a 30-minute fast-paced walk. I'm saying to myself, this man must be insane. He's on a speed-walking mission, but for him, it's normal.
just to keep up with the brother. And finally, <laughs> I said, you know what? <laughs> they wanted to carry my bag. I said, no, no, I'm going to carry my own bag. I'm going to hold my own weight. But I'm in pretty good shape, but it was uh, it wasn't easy. It mm -hmm. wasn't, and I said, okay, all right, uh, don't slip. That's the name. <laughs> don't slip. <laughs> don't, don't show any vulnerability. <laughs> but to get there is special to hear from them. And, they under, and, and guess what? It's a series of relays to get to the chief. You, you don't just go in there. It's, it's a series of relays and and not everybody has a cell phone and not everybody has a phone that's working because there's no reception anyway. So it's a, a number of um, uh, it's a number of steps to be able to or channels, I would say, say in order to get this kind of information. And it ain't easy at all, but it's absolutely rewarding because there's nothing to me that can be more important maybe equally as important but not more important in oral history so i love that along with being able to interpret the artifacts myself and they're all on the same plane but keep in mind brothers and sisters that mainstream scholars by and large they typically dismiss oral history because that means you got to go directly to the people you got to respect them you got to respect what they say and not simply go by somebody else's interpretation of an artifact where you don't have to rely on the people no, we've got to rely on the people because, like, for example, the example I gave earlier, the Dinka were talking about the culture markets. They said the British are the ones that imposed that. And so that was interesting, useful information. But I happen to know as a historian that it didn't start there. You know, there's ancient images of the same thing. So maybe the British took an existing practice and then they made it negative so that they can, can decide on, you know, who they're going to enslave and exploit. Anyway, but oral history, paramount in terms of a serious research approach. Yeah, another thing I just wanted to add, and we'll get into some other areas, Sudan, Kush, and some other things you can go into. Um, African cultures share a common cultural unity, meaning uh, most of it is pretty similar. They may have different names for netters or rishas or whatever, uh, but basically you're gonna find a lot of commonality. Now, when, for example, in the Nile Valley, you're taking written sources because uh, there are those and they're valuable. So, for example, in a previous show, I've given this as an example. Um, people who even write today talk about the comedic conception of the ideal person, Jeru Ma, G E R U M A A. And so, you will get a certain interpretation based on reading the scripts, but also based on who's interpreting them, you know? So generally, um, the uh, interpretation that will come from certain of our scholars, for example, will be ideal person, model human being. Um, and, and they'll give some other characteristics. But when you can go to a culture that is practicing this today and uh, you get from the mouth of the masters of the culture what that means, then it brings a whole new light. And it's not inconsistent, but you're gonna have a better understanding of it. So I've given this example before among the Bambara, B-A-M-B-A-R-A, -A -A, people from Mali who live close to the Dogon. Um, their term for this same person is Ma, M-A-A, -A, minus G-R-U, D-E-R-U, minus that. What does it mean? Self-mastered person, same thing. But what else do you get from that? Because here, if you're dealing with a traditional person, you're going to get a spirit interpretation. Notice I didn't say spiritual. Spirit interpretation. And so what are they going to tell you? They tell you, as uh, one of the great Bambara masters, Hampati Ba. See, I always cite my sources. And when I'm citing sources, I'm not just citing written sources. I'll cite Jacob Carruthers, because I apprenticed under him. I will say, according to Jacob Carruthers, blah, blah, blah. That's the African way. You go back to your source, and that source will also tell you uh, the wisdom that that person contained, the integrity that they contained. And so in this particular case, Hampati Ba, one of the last traditionalists in Africa who was also trained under the French system, 
but was initiated under the African system of masters, he points out that Ma is a person who has mastered the forces within them. Forces. You're not going to hear this in comedic writing. Not in writing, but interpretation. Why? They've taken the spirit out. So you have to understand that this is a human being and their view of the human being is the human being is made up of multiple forces, energies, you know? And so this is a person who has mastered them. And then they say, and they say this in the comedic literature too, but now you understand it better. This is a quiet person, not that talkative. Why? Because they are consumed with managing the forces within they are, cons uh, you know, c communicating with those forces and they are using their mastery to help other people. They're, they're not alone meditating. Africans don't meditate, by the way. That, that's <laughs> not a bad thing to do. I'm just saying that ain't how Africans do it. Right. You know what I mean? So um, what you and then when that rare person among the Bambara walks by, everyone else will say, there goes Ma, the representative of the ideal person. You'll only get that by going through the oral sources of people who are alive today and who can tell you. And by the way, if you really want to understand mystery systems, you won't understand it unless you're able to uh, get into the Babalaos and the various other fathers and mothers of mystery who have been initiated. And they're not going to give you everything either. So this is a part of the uh, value of uh, going to primary sources. And I, I don't know if people really get this because mm. all of this Eurocentric stuff. So let's get into uh, the Sudan and um, some of the uh, deeper stuff that you just want to, you know, at least some of the stuff that you like to exchange beyond what you talked about. In your okay. Research. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, one of the things that's, uh, significant is to uh, look at the sedan in the southern part because it's very different than the um, it's, it's it's closer to South Sudan and Kenya not just geographically but even culturally so you find uh, different groups that are linked to the Cushitic language and this is why it's very important to look at the southern areas in Sudan Sudan now as you know as other countries as well has political issues. When I was last there in January of 19, by April of 19, they had overthrown uh, Omar Bashir. So it's been big changes in the country. And I decided that uh, we couldn't really accomplish much as as we had in the past in Sudan, but, um, but to spend more time in Ethiopia and South Sudan. But one of the things that's very important is that um, these traditional roles that are important. One of the things that that has been presented in the U.S., for example, the last maybe handful of years, people know about uh, Jegna. And I had posted some of this on Facebook, but Jegna, and um, I know Spell that. that. Spell uh, that. J-E-G-N-A. Uh, J-E-G-N-A. So people have seen the name Jegna. They use that in Ethiopia in Amharic. And... Um, but I, but I, uh, and I, and so in our interviews, I, I'm listening here as they're translating, and, and the name, can, and I kept hearing Jegna, Jegna. Just so I asked my colleague Andu Alam, I said, brother, are you mentioning this this term Jegna or they? I said, no, no, it's them. This is very significant because uh, a Jegna in Amharic in Ethiopia, it's a, uh, in in one word, it's a hero. It's a very special person, a hero. A hero does something extraordinary for his people. And then I also learned that it's not just Jegna, there's Jegnit. So that would be for women, J-E-G-N-I-T, there's Jegnit. But I don't see that in the U.S. It's like a male-oriented Jegna, but it's it's a hero, someone who does something extraordinary to um, save the people from danger or maybe kill a dangerous animal, maybe a elephant or a leopard, which is very, very difficult to do, very difficult, 
but someone who's rooted in the culture and who promotes the 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 welfare of the people in the culture. This person is elevated to very high status. And they're highly respected, and there's very few people that are at the level of a jegna or a, a jegnit. But as I learned about this, and I kept hearing this as we were going around to the rural areas, and I asked my colleague about this, he said, no, he said, no, professor, they are mentioning jegna. So I'm listening more carefully because they have to translate from the local language to Amharic and then from Amharic to English. So, you know, so my colleague knows the deep level of knowledge that I want. And I'm asking questions from two and three different angles, because if I say to them, like, for example, why do you use um, the leopard or, 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 or why do you use the ostrich feather, whether it's in Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, or oh, we just like the feather. Now, if you just take that answer, then you don't get very much. Wait a minute. All birds have feathers. So why this bird? So then I'm drilling deeply to challenge them beyond just the surface information. And I learned that all, most of the cultures in Ethiopia have a name for a hero, a special person that is part of the tradition. So like um, somebody had asked about Jegna, this special uh, person who's a great hunter, who does something extraordinary, who's one of the rare people that can wear the leopard skin outfit because of the high status. And somebody had posted, um, they had posted the Aromo, um, or yeah, I think they posted the, the Aromo uh, name, Goti, uh, sorry, uh, Gota, G-O-T-A-A, G-O-T-A-A, the Aromo, which have, which have a tremendous cultural structure in the age grade system of rulership. And he is not just gota, it is gotiti for the important balance. It's uh, hopefully y'all can still hear me, but it's the important balance that is not, you know, there's these names for a hero and uh, masculine, but there's in many, not necessarily everyone, but many, there's the female name. And so the gotiti, just like the the uh, the jagnit is the women's role, but these are so special because then it it helps to explain you know the rank beyond a king or a chief or a provisional chief, but it's those special um, it's those special heroes that play a, a significant role in the society, and of course when they pass on, then they become highly respected uh, ancestors, as we see. Um, in, in cultures like the Kansu, uh, uh, sorry, the, sorry, the, the, the Kanso, the, the Kanso people. And um, so this is one of the things that I'm intrigued by, and that is these people who have a special uh, place in the society because of their special contributions to protecting, promoting, and maintaining the cultural traditions. And so um, if we were trying to translate that now, you know, then it would probably be maybe those oral historians and those who remember, those who hear, who understand the past and who are attempting to uh, help people to understand the past and recover from historical amnesia. So if we were trying to translate it into maybe our terms, then it would be, you know, an intellectual, a scholar who's not just a scholar on paper, who's not just a scholar in academia or the four walls of the academy or at some dry, sterile academic environment, but a scholar of the people. As as, as our uh, 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 was was saying earlier, is that it's, it's about scholarship that's rooted in the best interest, interest of the community. So on our terms, a hero would be someone who has that authentic connection to the community and they use their scholarship to help benefit the community. So we were trying to translate Jegna or Jagnit, then this would be the con context. Not just somebody wrote a lot of books. Is this helping to maintain the culture? Is this helping to maintain and protect and promote the traditions? That's what these many groups have, and it's special to meet these folks because um, it's not often that you meet somebody who is of hero status 
and who have, and, and also someone with extraordinary bravery as well, who will go out and, and put, so a lot of times if they're going to back, that's the person that, <laughs> because they know that he's going to be on the front line. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so, they, so they won't go to battle unless this special hero with tremendous, uh, not only connection to the culture and pr promoting and preserving the culture, but who has extraordinary uh, culture to learn about these special place in the society because this is deep rooted African uh, uh, cultural we hear from others because they're not asking those kind of questions you know they're not so that's something I want to share so these the whole region is very special and then you know once some of the political issues in Sudan um, become less hot then we'll go back and continue to work in Sudan and but in the meantime is the related cultures in South Sudan Right, there's been a little breakup of your voice every now and then. So just keep talking and it'll probably pick up. Um, so yeah, Jedna can also, as you just pointed out, Jedna's someone of exceptional so quality. Think, uh, someone that's uh, serving a cause bigger than themselves, making them a hero. And so an Ella Baker would be a Jedney, um or a Malcolm X, or it could be anyone that we don't know that much about, but have made sacrifices for the people beyond the ordinary. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, that's important. We've often, uh, black scholars here who know about this term, have usually used this to mean master, you know? Uh, but there are terms in specific African societies that refer to people who, in their country marks, They've gone to the highest level of mastery in the Dogon system, Sodaya, or in the Bambara system, Donikiba, makers of knowledge. That is, they've discovered some truth out there that no one knew about before. So, you know, they come up with some new ideas that advance humanity, but masters. But I'm glad you gave the male and female name for it, because very often all we hear is the male name. You know what I mean? Is there any other things that you'd like to cover on the Sudan? Um, I would say no, other than the my work continues in the, the Sudan region because there's no other way to know about the more distant and deep history of Kush unless the field work is done in Sudan. I mean... It's a special place, and you know, and people should know there's twice as many pyramids in Sudan as there is in Kemet, and it's a unique culture, and they're not just simply imitating someone else. It's a unique cultural uh, region with unique historical contributions. So we should. So the Sudan is a important area, as is South Sudan, in order to understand um, the history of the region and the historical contributions, and the people are so. There, you know, it's, it's an area that really it is ripe. Well, I wouldn't say ripe, but it's, a, it's an area that needs more attention because we'll learn more than we ever could imagine. But with all of that great history and even current culture, it, uh, Sudan is, and, and also South Sudan, they're not tourist areas. So what I'm focusing on doing when I go back to do field work later this year is to open up South Sudan. We'll, we'll wait on Sudan, but open up South Sudan because it's not easy. You got to have everything organized. You got to have uh, every your driver, the security. You got to know where to stay. You got to have the right connections, the translators. It's a whole apparatus that has to be put in place to make sure that a tour uh, of the area can happen. So as I do my field work, is to make sure that these foundational uh, pieces are in place because my goal is to actually take an educational group to South Sudan in 2024, and then we'll we'll see about Sudan. But it's uh, you know you got to kind of recognize that 
when there's political turmoil, we can't always go to every place. <laughs> but the region itself requires more than than just some photos that people grab online, but actually the field work. And that's why I believe the people are so supportive because they understand that I, in my independent work, is are I'm able to elevate the significance of their culture and help retain it because of my uh, uh, focus on what they're doing and linking their current practices to the past. And they're more than happy to, uh, to, to, you know, give as much detail about it. So, so uh, that's what I would say is that the work continues in the field of Kushology. So you have anything else to say about Kush and your work in? Just um, that I know that's probably including that. Yeah, else? no, I, I would say that basically uh, my work on Kush as it continues, the region uh, of the field work is Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia. And then I'll finally be able to do the more systematic work on the uh, the Cushitic uh, history and language system and related groups related to old Kush in uh, northern Kenya and uh, in Uganda. So um, I'm going to also be publishing my work on Kush. So later this year, people should look for uh, a field uh, field work report. It'll be two on on uh, on Kush, and so that's 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 coming out. I'm really excited about it because it's. It's, um, I wouldn't say the culmination because the work continues, but it certainly is an important plateau that I can now share a comprehensive uh, amount of knowledge about the practices today that intimately and fundamentally linked to uh, ancient Kush. And there's no way to understand this unless we're in the field because very few people are even thinking about this, let alone doing the field work. So uh, I'm just... Ha uh, happy to be able to do pioneering work in uh, in uh, in Kushology, so appreciate. It. And I'm you know I'm following in the footsteps of Chancellor Williams in terms of him prioritizing the southern area with his uh, work because you know he has a map. He called it the Ethiopian Empire. He's really referring to Kush, and and Nubia is in the southern part, and then Kemet is in the northern part. So that's that was a framework that I started with in 1989 when I began to do primary research. And um, and I continue with that today. So that's mainly the, the main things. And I would say for folks that if they really want to know uh, the primary research, they can can um, contact me at mainnewampim at gmail. And and I'm doing a primary research seminar. And there's three parts. We finished the first part dealing with what is primary research, what are the broad elements of primary research, what are the, the foundation, what are the tools of the trade of first-hand research. But the second one on February 6th would be uh, primary research and museum studies. And then the one in March would be primary research and field studies to really look at what I'm doing in terms of Kushology and uh, how people can better understand the significance of Kush and why the field research and collecting that that um, that knowledge is so important. And by that time as well, um, when I finish the work in the next year or so, I'll be able to have a uh, my film crew with me so they can document me documenting the history, which is very important because most of it is me documenting the history. But people have to know what the process is to look at the origins of Kush through primary research. So by, uh, if not this summer, by certainly 24, we'll be able to have the film crew to, to really put together a high quality professional documentary so that we can um, continue to have an impact in Kushology. So that's mainly what I wanted to share with, with your group, Doc, and I appreciate the opportunity to do just that. Right on. Uh, so we can go to some questions uh, then. Uh, one is, a question is, what can people do uh, in the U.S. and probably other places to aid you in your work? Uh, a couple things. One is the, the kind of the obvious is that um, nobody, no institution sponsors what I do. I pay because it's part of my mission in life. I didn't choose the mission. The mission chose me. So we do have a donation page. You can go to um, uh, well, a couple of our sites, but you can go to um, advancingtheresearch.org. You can make a contribution there to uh, help with our 
numerous expenses. You can donate one time and you can become a recurring donor. Um, so I really encourage that. And um, just go to our website. You can even go directly to PayPal and just put in uh, my email address, mainnewampim at gmail, and you can become a subscriber there. That's one thing. And then secondly, just get the word out. Spread the word to people in your network and purchase our materials. Purchase my book, A History of African Civilizations, to get the word out and to help us with a revenue base because the more people that assist then it will make the work uh easier to accomplish we're going to do the work but why should it take twice as much time because we don't have as much support so get the word out please and then you can also um uh, contribute as well and purchase our materials or simply make donations and everybody's welcome to join our tours as well so you can learn and if you know people that really want to learn professional research methods and contribute to the project of helping us recover from historical amnesia, then by all means, come uh, or have them come learn the skill set and they can become colleagues or do similar work where we can collaborate. So that's what I would share. Okay, uh, Brother Lao Tzu, uh, he asks, uh, Menu. Um, and has anyone secured the field notes of Dr. Chancellor Williams that he used in writing the destruction of black civilization? Man, let me tell you something. Doc, uh, this is one of the most, okay. So Augie Ogborn, Aug, uh, brother Augie Ogborn, and, and you know what, I'm gonna tell it straight so everybody understands how crazy things are. You ask me, I'm gonna tell you how it is. Okay, so Augie Ogborn, he, he was the official photographer for Chancellor Williams. So if any of you have seen a picture, this iconic picture of Chancellor Williams, John Henry Clark, and Dr. Yosef Benjokanen, and um, it's a picture that you can find, it's online. And um, when I was looking for a picture, I did a presentation on following in the footsteps of Dr. Chancellor Williams, and I found this picture online. I didn't know when it was from or where it was at, and I used it in my presentation because it was just in the public domain. And then the brother contacted me, said, hey, look, brother, I really respect your work. Keep up the good work. But that's my picture. Really? That's your picture? So where did he come from? So he was telling me he was at the O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And Dr. Uh, uh, Chancellor Williams was in the city to speak. And he had met with Ben and Clark. He didn't know who Ben and Clark was. So anyway, uh, I was scheduled to, to look at. Uh, actually, I looked at the notes of Chancellor Williams, so I know who he sent his book out to, Destruction of Black Civilization in 71, who he sent copies to, all of the records, because the brother, Augie Ar Arpa, he kept all of those records, a lot of details. He had notes, groceries, notes, <laughs> and a whole lot of other stuff. So uh, he respects Chancellor Williams, and so do I. So I was scheduled to go to, um, to D.C. because I looked at it to... Really, I said, well, brother, if we don't publish the work on this influence of Dr. Chancellor Williams, then somebody else at some point is going to publish and misrepresent his work. We need to do that. And it ain't about money. It's about uh, it's about legacy and making sure that we can, can, can write a definitive story about Chancellor's work. And but guess what? Somebody came along, some hustler in D.C., some businessman comes and says, oh, no, no. Don't do that because you can make money from it. What? What are you talking about? Making money. So I said, look, man, look, Elder, um, that's crazy. This ain't your stuff. Are you, you know, uh, you can't just sell somebody else's materials like that. Uh, you know, and besides, what happened to uh, dealing with the legacy? So anyway, um, it's, uh, it's out there somewhere because some guy came along and wanted to find a way to make money. And this is one of the most crazy experiences where here it is, we could promote one of the great scholars and help protect his legacy. And uh, and then somebody came along trying to figure out how to make money. Well, if it was that valuable and everybody understood the value, then, you know, all those offers to sell it to Howard and other places, they would have taken it. You know, he's, he's an alumnus of Howard University. Anyway, but this is how things work. And folks need to know that this is why, just like... Um, Jake Beeson wrote his book, Why We Lose. This is why we lose. Here we go from an authentic effort to promote one of the great scholars. And then somebody comes along and says, no, 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 let's try to find out how to make money. And um, so that's what happened. So I don't know, um, you know where a lot of this stuff is at today, but we had access to it. So 
that's what happens, folks. That's where black folks are sometimes, sometimes. So uh, that information included his field notes and stuff, the research that he did? Uh, that's the whole thing. I didn't see all of it. I saw a lot of it. it it's, it's a lot of his personal, uh, not just family stuff, but it's a lot of his personal records. So I would assume that if it didn't include all of his field notes, it would have to include some. It, it certainly I saw the part and I was okay. I was I was able to to pinpoint when certain notes were written. Because as a historian, you know, you see different clues. Okay, he's making this reference. This must have been right after he published the rebirth of African civilization. So you can pinpoint the year by certain references that he's making. So it requires a knowledge of the times and the person involved to be able to give a, a general estimated date. But um, I don't know that question, but I would not be surprised if some of it did include his field notes, But because that would have been in, in the 50s, for example, going back to the 50s, it's quite possible because um, some of these records were seem, seemingly very well um, organized and um, and and uh, and maybe even catalog to some degree. Um, M. Jewell uh, makes a comment. It's kind of a question. Isn't it the case that African terms normally speak to a lifestyle or path like an Araba or Babalao? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, She's asking uh, when you have African terms described. Oh different things in an African civilization, doesn't that speak to a lifestyle? Or a way uh, of life? Yeah, lifestyle. I would say it speaks to the cultural values for sure. And that's why for me, when I'm interviewing the the heroes, elders, chiefs, kings, kings, it's 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 to ask a lot of questions seemingly about the same thing. No, it's to really like for example, if like with every group, I ask them, why do you call this practice by this name? Oh, it just means such as, no, 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 but why? What else do, do you use this term for anything else that might have a different meaning? And so it's always important to go to the root of why they're calling a practice or person or, or something by this term. So, yes, it, it speaks to their values. And it also speaks to their understanding of the fundamental characteristics of that particular, let's say, a uh, thing, whether it's a plant or animal. Because, like you know, I was mentioning the Dinka and and some of the animals, but some of these cultures they are fundamentally linked to cattle. It, 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 cattle is equivalent to wealth, and right. it's like there's so many different terms to to for a cat a cow. It depends on the color. In the very detail. So now, when I'm listening to songs, it, it has a much greater. I'm not just looking at listening at the beat. I'm listening at their reference to certain cattle, and uh, Morial, and you know, cattle that have the highest rank because of their special color pattern. And then I'm asking them, but why this name? You know, what else do do you use this name for anything else? And then, so it, it really has to do a lot with their values and why they may name something or or create a term for whatever it is but they just don't name it any old thing you know and, and one thing i know too and when learning I'm, I'm glad to know this is that as you know, i'm sure most of the folk listening and watching knows that these terms have value whereas in the u.s somebody can be given a name and they don't even know what their name means it's just a word <laughs> but you don't find it's not just a word it's 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 a it's a meaning behind that word and that's why it gives us an idea of their value system when we can can really go beyond the surface of a particular name for something. Uh, this is a comment. The real African is, yes, she's riffing off of something you said. While visiting some of the museums and sites in different African countries, I have experienced many of the guides who base their knowledge on Western sources and interpretations. Good point. So when I'm out in the field, um, that's one of the main points. And, and, and well, let me just say this, when I'm out in the field and I'm dealing with academics, people in the university areas, uh, whether it's in Ethiopia or South Sudan, very sharp, 
very sharp, but I noticed that there's a strong tendency to quote and follow the ideas of Western foreigners. And then when they're interacting with me, they find out that um, I'm very familiar with those works, but I don't spend a lot of time dealing with them or giving them credibility. In fact, as an example of that, that's why I'm here, because I don't agree with them. I don't, I don't accept any of it. And a lot of it, like this guy's talking about the name for a group, the one who stinks. Really? You're going to actually present that to the public? And think we're gonna go for it? We don't go for that crazy. Right. Go sit, sit your ass down. So, <laughs> you know. who's, who's stinking himself? <laughs> the stench of Europe needs to be erased. You know what I mean? So, you want to talk about stink? You know? exactly. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, hey, you know, I, I wanted to say thing. Uh, I know you all are talking about Chancellor Williams. We don't know exactly when he, uh, his, his dates, you know, I think um, maybe actually when he passed, okay, maybe, but, but when he was born, we don't know. There's no records of that. Uh, one thing I did learn from Augie Ogborn, he had said that the family would, they nicknamed him um, Spanish boy because he was apparently born around the Spanish-American War. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of like an interesting clue. That would have been 1898. You know, so there's different years. You'll find 1898, 1893. The bottom line is that there's no definitive records to say that. But as a historian who does the primary research, what we do is look at records and then we make an assessment of what record or records are more credible than others or more likely than others. So that's why if you see my writings or presentation on Chancellor Williams, I will always say, well, I'll, I'll put a C. You know, a C before the date, meaning circa means about or around, because we don't know the exact year. Because, uh, but that clue about the, the family calling him Spanish boy, 1898, is possible, and that would um, lend more credibility to that year as opposed to let's say 1893. But you know, as a historian, you have to be careful and make sure that you can authenticate what it is you're presenting, because documentation beats conversation every day of the week. Yeah, Chancellor Williams, John Henry Clark, Doc Ben, um, we had them all out to speak at a conference at an organization that I had organized in the 70s, Pan-African Secretariat, that was an extension of the Pan-African People's Organization, uh, had. They were called State of the Race Conferences, and I'll show you a picture. I've shown it once before. Most of you haven't seen it. And um, it's uh, it, the State of the Race Conference came from the idea of uh, one of the members of our organization. And um, this right here is a picture of Chancellor Williams. See that? And it's Queen Mother Moore sitting next to him. And May Mallory. He's in the white pants. Huh? He's in the white pants, right? Uh, yeah, he's in the white Williams pants the right there with his briefcase um, right in front of him. And he had addressed this conference. It was around 1977. Queen Mother Moore is next to him. And uh, then the brother who came up with the idea of uh, calling this the State of the Race Conference. And then on the side there, if I can go further over there, that's me with the big natural holding my arms up, that ivory. And the brother next to him is my best friend, K. Andy Solawazi. He's had you out to President City <laughs> College quite a few times. Brother Kahende, yes, yes. Brother Kahende, he's a really beautiful brother. And um, then on the opposite side, uh, behind Chancellor Williams and May Mallory, uh, is a delegation from the United Kingdom. And the brother, uh, who's got a little red African crown on, that's Ron Phillips. He was an engineer from Guyana and was a spokesperson for the uh, Black delegation from the United Kingdom to the Sixth Pan-African Congress, where I chaired the political committee. So, you know, we had the pleasure of having him in my house, interacting with him, and, uh, you know, it's it a wonderful thing. We had over a 1,000 people attend each one of these conferences. And the brother who came up with the idea of the conference, his name was Yemi Touré, uh, he passed on a few years ago. He was a journalist, a black journalist. So uh, to him goes that credit. Um, let's see. 
Lao Tzu, uh, Dr. Menu Ampen. What are your thoughts on why certain societies in Africa developed writing and others did not? Also, what are the limitations of a society's dependent dependence on oral systems? Um, well, you know, uh, one of the things about writing, uh, obviously, it's a way to communicate and leave records. So um, it really depends to me on the um, kind of the uh, the development of the society, the more stratified and sophisticated it becomes, and people are concentrated in urban areas, then you're, you're going to have writing. But those that are still uh, in the more rural areas, they don't necessarily have as much of a need for uh, writing systems. And so it really depends on the development of the society. But, you know, writing clearly is, is uh, valuable. It's one of the uh, unique African contributions to the world. This is why we always focused on Patajo Tep, who wrote the first book in the history of humanity with 37 lessons on ethical and moral conduct. Um, so that's one thing. So you do have different writing systems. But in terms of the oral history, um, I uh, I wouldn't say really uh, that it's a limitation unless the society becomes more and more urbanized. Then they tend to have to, you know, in the modern world, they need a writing system. One of my colleagues in South Sudan, um, Alou Majok, he's come up with a, rev a revolutionary approach to creating a, um, he calls it the Nidalarian, you know, like the Nile River, the Nidalarian script, where he's taken indigenous uh, symbols that people use in the Nile Valley from Sudan, South Sudan, and that whole area there, that symbols that they use in the Nile Valley and creating a whole writing system, whole script based on images that everyone's familiar with in the region. You know, Uganda, you name the place, uh, the different plants, the animals. And so uh, his Nilarian script is very significant. And also, if you look at how scripts are valuable today, um, you look at the Cherokee, for example, they helped during the World War in the U.S. because the foreigners didn't know that language, just like the, the Nilarian script. But some of my colleagues were saying, look, this can help us in South Sudan, even from a military point of view. But but that's not necessarily the focus of Brother Aluma's joke. But this is a very uh, innovative approach to promoting the culture and knowing that uh, rural life, rural practices, uh, they're under a sea, they're under siege, they're under assault, and practices are fading away. And as as groups have to, to some degree, merge into the modern uh, modern society, and writing becomes more and more uh, crucial, more and more important. And I should also say, this is another reason why I've been fortunate enough to get a lot of support because they understand things are changing. You know, like like for example, I got just one example. Those Dinka chiefs, I would have had to go to Rumbek or um, or Wau or, or, or other places in South Sudan to meet that, that large group of uh, chiefs. But they all happened to be in the capital city of Juba. And most of some of them that you saw in that picture of elders, some of them had never been to Juba before, ever. So why were they there? They all were there for medical reasons. And they said to me that they believe that the modern medicine is better than their medicine because some of the modern medicine can address issues that they're not able to address. So they mentioned that to me. And so um, as they changed some of their practices, even though they try to maintain their value system, but as they change some practices, then in, uh, invariably, writing becomes a part of um, being able to function in the modern 21st century. So that's why groups, uh, some of the people, oh, and, and one other thing I might add, they also indicate there's three type of folks. There's a people that still live in the village, number one. There's a number two, the second group of those that live in the city areas like Juba, and they have to learn how to write or at least read if they're going to function. And then there's a third a group of people, they said, and those are the intellectuals. And they they said those are three distinct groups, and they um, and each one of them are uncomfortable in the other areas. So they told me they're uncomfortable in Juba. <laughs> they said the, the 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 city dwellers they find it very difficult to operate in the rural areas. So it's uh, really just depends on the situation. But as a lump sum, it's not really an advantage or disadvantage unless we're talking about 
can you be functional in the modern world? You got to know how to read and write uh, if you're going to be functional in this society as well as even in those societies as well. But that's a great question, by the way. Great, great question. Now, I think that Emerald Rock, Dr. Cheryl Johnson partially answered this because we're often also dichotomizing this and treating it as either a written or an oral and which one's better. And she makes a correct statement. She says, writing is meant to be spoken, oralized. There's no hierarchy of values. They're interdependent. True. In fact, meru nature means God speech. Meru nefer means human speech. Now, meru nature is written, but it's described as speech. Why? Because the speech, uh, the writing imitates speech. Why? You won't get this from Kevin. You're going to have to go to inner Africa to get it because it's the word when the spoken word is based on the truth, that's the power. And therefore, writing imitates speech. And so writing, as Dr. Carruthers described, and I discussed this in my last show, is a walking, talking, doing language. We continue that. That's a holiness preacher that walks, dances, shouts. You know what I mean? But it's the truth, the vibratory forces of speech you're not going to get that because for you, vibratory forces is spookism. <laughs> but that's what quantum <laughs> physics tells you everything is. It's energy. And so it's the vibratory force of God that the first ancestors, when they gained speech, uh, passed on, which is their wisdom. So on the one hand, um, speech imitates writing, where you have speech uh, where you have writing, speech is more highly valued, the oral. And so writing imitates it. The second thing is, um, I don't think it had any disadvantages for African civilizations. And, and they could be large ones that were oral because the mind um, was a repository of all that you needed. And you had people who were libraries who were the manifestations of that. And the key thing was on the truthfulness of whatever it was, if it was writing or if it was speech. The other thing is in Kemet, writing was restricted to the pharaoh and the priesthood. The average person couldn't write. So dig that one. You know what I mean? And uh, yet they had a civilization. But the fact is most of the people were outside of the writing. So what about that one? You know what I mean? So, you know, I, you, you know, I don't think those societies were disadvantaged at all by that. And that also means that if you're going to look at blacks who came into this country who couldn't write English, and then some of them later learned how to write, it didn't mean because they couldn't write, they were ignorant. And by the way, you have some blacks now who couldn't read, and they need to read. In a society like this, you need to read. But it doesn't mean they're dumb either. Because you know I mean? wisdom it is not based on whether you can write or not. It's based on whether you are drawing from the light within. Um, uh, Professor Ampen made the point that he runs into a lot of scholars. In this case, he's talking about African, but it's true, African-American, that all they can do is cite facts. <laughs> you know what I mean? They read. But that's as far as they read. There's no insight there. And I don't want to cite the number of scholars and which ones I know who haven't got any original ideas. And they are in their 80s. You know what I mean? What's going on there? That, that, ed that education was a miseducation because it didn't get you to think. And I I'm going to tell you, I'm not a fan of critical thinking either. You know, I, you know, I think critical thinking is fine. What about creative thinking? You know what I mean? What about being able to create something? Uh, it may not be new because there's nothing new under the sun, but it's something ain't nobody thought of before because you had an angle on it. Or maybe you come up with something that was there before that nobody ever saw, like Einstein's theory of relativity or George Washington Carver, all the things he came up, all kinds of creative black folks come up with. You know what I mean? So that's the real question. What are you doing with the light within? But if you start talking light, People get funny. What are you talking about? Some weed? 
some dope. <laughs> like, huh? What's that? That's the wisdom within. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here up here. Well, you know, just speaking of that, uh, I always have to clarify when we're discussing, when I'm discussing Kush, because I remember some years ago when I started to focus more exclusively on Kush, and I say, you know, folks, today we're going to talk about Kush and Kushology, and one of the young guys in the audience was very excited, he said, yay, and I, and I said, uh, young fellow, we're not talking about that kind of Kush, talking about dope and marijuana, I'm talking about the ancient Kushite civilizations. So let's get it straight. What we're talking about today? We ain't talking about no smoking, but uh, that's what they call Kush. That's the only knowledge that the average oh, person dude. has, particularly young young <laughs> folks, is Kush and dope as opposed to the ancient uh, civilizations. So we got to always clarify. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> and then dope is used now among the hip hoppers to mean something else. You know, something positive. It's dope, but uh, dope. Uh, to to be a dope in my generation was no compliment, you know what I mean? Generally, a dope, <laughs> a really. Dope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only lower than that is a dog, but a dope is dummy, you know what I mean? And, and you don't want to be a dummy if you're a brother, especially around a sister. That's about next to not having integrity, not having smarts. Because as as my good friend K. Andy Solawazi says, he says that the strongest uh, organ that a sister has is not her sex, it's her brain. And when she's stimulated by a wise brother who's also good, she's in heaven, believe it or not. And if a brother's got any sense, it's the same thing. You got to have you a sister who got something going on upstairs, you know, not just the spirit in the dark, you know, but the spirit who has light can be in the dark or anywhere else. Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Well, well Doc, I just want to uh, just say as we uh, close and I get ready to do another presentation, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share on uh, on uh, the origins of ancient Kush or Kushology and uh, sharing that with the audience. And you definitely... Um, was able to contextualize this, the importance of the primary research and and how that is at the core of us really understanding the uh, classical tradition from an inside perspective, because it's not just about reading somebody else's books or looking at half-baked docudramas or a Mickey Mouse disrespectful museum exhibit that exploits African mummies, uh, so-called mummies. These are ancestors who've been reduced to an object called a mummy. But we're doing the original uh, field work and then making that available to uh, the community. So I appreciate, you know, that opportunity. Right on. I appreciate you, brother. And you can see from our viewers here on the chat, they definitely appreciate this. And I want to say to everyone here, um, we appreciate you uh, for your interest and the work that you're doing to further our people's knowledge uh, by uh, Professor Menu Ampen's book. Um, subscribe to the show and also uh, make donations to his site. And also, you see here, uh, make donations you can see here uh, to this show. So, thank you, brother. Okay, thank, thank you, Doc. Everybody for viewing this. Hotel. Yes, sir. Hotel. Right. All right.